Good evening, friends. My name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm senior pastor here at Circular Congregational Church. And I'm glad to welcome you to our online service for Good Friday. At Circular, we say in the spirit of our progressive and inclusive faith, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, and it is good to gather on this night. In that spirit, I'd also like to invite you to our Easter Sunday services, which we'll hold on site at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Easter Sunday, and also online at 11 a.m. I hope you can join us for one of those. But as we move toward a service of Good Friday, we take a deep breath and remember that this is a somber evening for us, a time during every Holy Week when we remember and retell the story of the end of Jesus' life. And as we do that, we join with many others on this night who retell the story and we give special gratitude um, to others in our United Church of Christ, our UCC, who have helped us with this service even as they hold their own. So we give thanks to Reverend Michelle Terigian of St. Paul UCC in Belleville, Illinois, who wrote most of this service, and also our dear poet, Jan Richardson, um, who blessed us with a wonderful benediction. We're grateful to all who have contributed to this night. And in that spirit, we're invited to enter the story and remember who Jesus was and how he spent the end of his life. Please join me in the call to worship by reading the bold wording in the worship guide. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so distant from my groaning? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the midst of our tears, you do not answer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even in the shades of shelter, I do not find rest. God of the fearful and grieving, faith's eclipse of light has overtaken our souls. The darkness sits with us as a companion on this part of the journey. Confusion, exhaustion, tears and aches become part of the story. Even on the night of the sword, we will find solace. Even when the glances of neighbors pierce our hearts and their words swirl around in our minds, God's peace will alleviate any anxiety. Amen. Let's hear this prayer of confession. God of the healing wounds, the pain of our traumas, shadow the light that beams from our souls. From the shadows, 
we cast a shade upon our neighbors. Such gloom is a sword in their hearts. May we be aware of how our pain creates agony in the life of our neighbors. May we reach out to our companions on the journey when we have caused them grief in their own lives. Amen. Words of grace. Even when we abide in Gethsemanes and Golgothas and can't see the presence of the divine, God still abides with us. God's grace extends to us. May the soothing love and grace of God bring us peace even in valleys, gardens, and hills of shadows. And may we see hope for the future beyond the gloom. This evening we'll hear the story as told in the Gospel of John. And as we do, we begin by naming something in our own tradition. The Gospel of John has historically been used in anti-Semitic ways to place the blame for Jesus' death on people of Jewish faith. We reject anti-Semitism in all its forms and also anti-Muslim bias and as we read this evening, um, there will be minor adaptations uh, for inclusion and um, for care. And it's in that spirit that we begin uh, the story of the last days of Jesus. As the shadows of light creep in and the light takes its last breath, the dawn of betrayal begins to saunter into the tense and tender evening. God so loved the world that Jesus wept, knowing that betrayal and hate were sweeping across the land. The gift of understanding was swept away for money or fame or one's own protection. Out of privilege, out of fear, the light of the world, the greatest light, was extinguished bit by bit, hour by hour. After Jesus had spoken, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replied, 
I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these people go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. And then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that God has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who advised the people that it was better to have one person to die for the people. The light was extinguished for the hope of riches, for the booming voices of the powers that be. The charisma of power delight even the most faithful, enough for one to drown in shame and block one's sight from forgiveness. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. And the woman said to Peter, you are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself and they asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, aren't you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative, of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. The light was dimmed from the winds of denial, dimmed out of fear, holding one's breath, wondering if they knew and distancing from the light one denial, then two, and at the third, I do not know him, there was weeping from a torn soul. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the people come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat on the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusations 
do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, and judge him according to your law. The people replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. And this was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. The light was quenched by the ones in power, whether it was the top of religion or the top of the state. The light had no endurance when the two mixed their powers. They schemed together. Maybe, just maybe, they'll keep their control a little while longer by stamping out the light. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the people again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at this Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. The light was smothered by the ones who aimlessly followed the ones in power. Was it their demeanor, their voices, the way they made all the rules for them? Was it the way they sustained their privileges? Why would they follow the hateful instead of the one who beamed love? Why would they save the life of a bandit instead of the one who taught kindness? The light never mattered to this gathering. To the ones who loved strength through dominance, their empire was of this world. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The people answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. 
Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And from then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the people cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the people, here is your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side and with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek. And then the chief priests said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, and now the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Since it was the day of preparation, the people did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity, so they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. And then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the others who had been crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth so that you may also continue to believe. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture that says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. The light was dying out. After torture and beatings, after thorns pressed into his flesh, after dragging a wooden beam to the place of the skull, after nails driven and insults thrown, after the blood of life ran dry, it is finished, he said, as tired dimming light flickered into last movement and soberly died.
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The light was snuffed out from the dust of followers fleeing, not knowing what would come next and bolting to an undisclosed location. Terrified, they hid far, far away from events at the place of the skull, deserting the one, leaving the one behind. For the few who found strength and courage, for a mom and a few bold friends, we give our thanks. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the people, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, 
weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the people. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The light had died out from trauma and hate, from fear and frustration, from greed, ego, and power. The light was gone. By the time myrrh and aloes anointed the empty one, the light was gone. As spices and linen wrapped the empty one, the light was gone as the empty one was placed in the tomb, set in a space of shadows. And as the dust wrapped around the tomb, we too walk away. Song of the Winding Sheet by Jane Richardson. We never would have wished it to come to this, yet we call these moments holy as we hold you. Holy the tending, holy the winding, holy the leaving as in the living. Holy the silence, holy the stillness, holy the turning and returning to earth. Blessed is the one who came in the name. Blessed is the one who laid himself down. Blessed is the one emptied for us. Blessed is the one wearing the shroud. Holy the waiting, holy the grieving, holy the shadows and gathering night. Holy the darkness, holy the hours, holy the hope turning toward light. 